Welcome everybody to the inaugural first ever episode of the What It's Like To Be podcast. The podcast where every week I interview someone we find out what it's like to be. In this case, what's it like to be blind? My name is Tom Flaherty. I'm your host. Today, I have the absolute privilege and honor of introducing you to Francesco Magisano, who is a sprint distance triathlete, Olympic distance triathlete, ultra Ironman triathlete, ultraman triathlete, which is three times the distance of an Ironman marathon runner. He's got four podiums at the National for Cycling, one podium at the Nationals for Triathlon, and came third at the Continental Triathlon Championships. He's also director of Achilles International in New York City, and he also happens to be blind. Francesco, welcome to the show. Thanks, Tom. Super excited. Excellent. And may I add, most importantly, Francesco is a great friend of mine. So Francesco, tell us a little bit about yourself in terms of, you know, your upbringing, your condition, your eye condition, you know, were you born blind? Um, yeah. So when I was a baby, I was diagnosed with retinoblastoma, which is eye cancer. And so I was legally blind, but not totally blind till about 15, 16 years old. Um, and then I went totally blind between then and now. So now I'm 28 years old. I've been totally blind for like a little more than 10 years now. A little more than 10 years. And yeah, can you just tell us a little about, so you say that you're totally blind. Can you just tell us a little bit about the different types of blindness? Because you're totally blind. You have no shape perception, no light perception, nothing. It's even more than being in a dark room for people who are sighted. What about the other types of blindness out there? Yeah, I'd say most people who are legally blind are low vision, but not totally blind. So either, you know, they'll see shapes, they'll see if the lights are on or off. Uh, some people can't see colors, but they'll see perfectly, you know, just in grayscale. Um, so there's definitely different types of blindness. Um, for me, you could literally shine a flashlight in my face and I wouldn't see that it was on or off. Got it. And does everyone who is blind have a cane? No. So yeah, if, if you need some sort of aid, um, you either have a cane or you have a service animal, uh, usually a, a seeing eye dog. Um, and the dog's purpose is to, you know, obviously avoid obstacles. The cane's purpose is to hit obstacles so that you know it's there. So it's a little bit of a different philosophy. Um, I use a cane just because I, I, I like the, the flexibility of just having an object that I don't have to feed and take out to the bathroom. Um, right. But everyone has their own options yet. Got it. And, and, you know, Francesca, you're six foot six, which, which is one of the reasons why I don't like having photos next to you because I look even shorter <laughs> than I really am in real life. But, you know, so for you, is it a bit like going into like that, that in Harry Potter going and getting a, a wand and they kind of like look at you and they, and they see your, you know, how tall you are, your background and stuff, and they fit your cane accordingly um, based on your height, based on a few different yeah. preferences? How does that work? Yeah, it's based on height, based on walking speed. You know, the faster you walk, the longer cane you want. So for me, I'm tall, I walk fast. They basically have to go into the back room and like go <laughs> to the super secret corridors and just <laughs> grab the grab the special edition cane. That's so interesting. So the faster you walk, the longer your cane is. Yeah, because you want to, you know, you want to catch things before you hit them, obviously. So two, three strides before you arrive at something, you want to hit it. That's so interesting. So I reckon all the blind people in uh, New York have longer canes just because everyone in New York walks faster. Yeah, oh, totally. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then I noticed uh, one thing at the end of the cane, um, it people have different kind of shapes at the end of the cane. What's what's that about? Like some sometimes it's a ball, sometimes it's like a kind of like a cone. Yeah, most popular. Um, there's either like a really big, kind of like a tennis ball kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I'm not a fan of those because that's not super. It, it, it's more broad, right? It doesn't give you as much feedback. Yeah. Um, I have a, a little rolling marshmallow type thing. Um, there's also a pencil tip, which is it doesn't roll at all, and it's just a little like pointy thing that you could tap around. Got it. So interesting. So let's talk about triathlon because I mean, you know, it was amazing to me when I first met you to even know that blind people did triathlon. Uh, so I, I actually want to really quickly insert the story of how we met. Um, this whole interview is going to be about you, but I'm going to briefly talk about how we met because I'm a triathlete. I was signed up for a race in Central Park in New York City a few years ago. I was good to go. The gun was about to go for the race. And then someone sh screams out, can someone guide an Achilles athlete? And I'd never heard this term before, you know, what's an Achilles athlete? But I could see no one was volunteering. So I said to the lady, well, what's an Achilles athlete? And she said, oh, it's a blind athlete. And I thought, you know, no one's volunteering. Okay, if I do volunteer, I might won't be able to get on the podium myself. But if I don't volunteer, you know, this guy is 
not going to race at all and he's blind and so they bring you over six foot six francesco magisano and you teach me how to guide you while we're running like we're literally in the race running and we have this hand tether, which I never used before. You were so chilled. I was like, this guy's life is in my hands. I'm running with this guy, super chilled. We do the run course of this. It goes run, bike, run. And I actually, amazingly, this other guy called Ralph was there watching his girlfriend doing the race in full cycling gear, had his cycling shoes on. The same lady asked if he could do the cycling portion with Francesco. Lo and behold, his shoes clipped into the bike, no problem, which was another small miracle. He was also just one rung below professional cycling. So that helped. And then I handed him over to Francesco. I handed Francesco over to him and he took Francesco around on the bike. And then I met Francesco for the run and we finished the run and we, we finished the race. And Francesco, you end up winning your entire age group against able-bodied athletes. And I was like, this is incredible. And Francesco very kindly asked me to go on the podium with him at the end. So I got to go on the podium as well. And it was the best race that I've ever done because, you know, triathlon is very selfish. You know, I'm, I'm used to racing by myself, but you don't get that joy uh, that you do when you race with someone else and you're helping someone else. And then I remember you and I, we added each other on Instagram and I was like, how is this guy on Instagram? You can't see. It's incredible. And then after I'd had lunch and come back home, I looked at my phone and I looked at Instagram and you posted 10 perfect photos, a massive chunk of text. And it was perfectly written, not one mistake. And the first line, which I will never forget, was today isn't about me. It was about these two stu superstar athletes who last minute volunteered to help me achieve my goals of doing this race. And I just like lost it. And you know, I've told you this story so many times, <laughs> but I wasn't, I wasn't so much like, like crying as I was uncontrollably sobbing at my dining room table by myself being like, I found the thing that I want to do now and put all my efforts into. I want to guide blind triathletes. And so that's how we met. But let me ask you a question. For those people who don't know, how do you actually train for and do a triathlon as a blind person? How do you actually do the swim? How do you do the bike? How do you do the run? In training or in racing? Let's let's start with training and then and then we can get into yeah. racing. So I train in a pool. Um I am able to swim like without a tether. Um because I just, I trail the lane lines. So every, you know, two, three strokes, I kind of brush the lane line with my hand just to make sure I'm going straight and, you know, not crossing over. Um, most of the biking is done indoors on a trainer. Uh, and the runs, I do have a treadmill, but, you know, it's soul sucking. So I have a lot of people that I run with outdoors where we tether and run outdoors. Um, for racing, I'm bungeed around the upper leg. There's a bungee cord with two loops. Um, and that keeps, you know, my guide and I together. Outdoors, we race on a tandem bike, and then we run also tethered uh, waist to waist with two race belts. Got it. So the swim, bungee cord, bike, tandem bike, run, yeah. another type of tether uh, that we run side yeah. by side. And so, you know, a lot of people, I'd say 50% of the people when I, they, when I tell them about the tandem bike, they do ask me who sits on the front. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not kidding. Even really smart people. And um, who sits on the front, Francesco? Is it the blind person well, or is it the sighted person? I will say I, I have gotten on the front of tandems uh, sometimes. <laughs> that is true. I've and... actually seen Francesco ride a bike <laughs> by himself with other people around telling him to turn left and right. And that's yeah. that's terrifying uh, for me as a, as, a, as a viewer. It must be like even more terrifying <laughs> for you as the person doing it. Yeah, totally terrifying. No, no. During <laughs> racing, I'm in the back. The person with working eyeballs is in the front. <laughs> and I, I got to ask you because you know we've raced together we you did your first half Ironman with me we did it in he was the first blind athlete to race uh the Sardinia set Ironman 70.3 in Italy and what's it like to be on the back of a tandem when I mean at times we were going like maybe 40 miles an hour round corners down hills and you know I can see and I'm controlling the bike but what's it like to be you know, relinquish your control completely to someone else like me, be going 45, 40 miles an hour down a bend on the back of a tandem with no control. It's, it's a lot about relinquishing control, right? Like I, I used to be and still am in some ways very much a control freak. Like I love just being in control of whatever I'm doing. And when you're on the back of a bike, like there is no way, right? You're not, there's no control. So it, it helps if you trust the person. Like when I race with you, Tom, like I know you're a good bike handler. So I know like 
yes, we might still crash, but it's not because you don't know how to handle a butt, right? It's because some other, something else happened. The really scary times is when I'm on the back of life and I don't trust the pilot. Like that's when it's like, oh my goodness, I just, <laughs> I, it's so stressful. <laughs> Um, I this part of my job is training new tandem pilots for Achilles. So I'm on the bike with a lot of first timers and that's, that's a really sketchy. <laughs> that is unbelievable. You're so, I just got to say you and the other blind athletes that I train with and race with, you're so brave. Like what I just said, you're so brave, like to be able to put that kind of trust in other people, your lives are literally in other people's hands. And I, I can I can never do it because you know part of what we do on these camps is you know as guides we sit on the back as you know Francesco we sit on the back of the tandem and close our eyes to feel what it's like to be blind when someone else is in control of the tandem we just do it in a parking lot on the flat going you know like five miles an hour I did that I was absolutely terrified I could never do what you do Francesco and you guys are just absolutely phenomenal so I got a few other questions uh unrelated to triathlon so what can't you do that sighted people can do like what are the big things the big limiters um that you cannot do that sighted people can do um first thing that comes to mind uh which seems obvious but driving right like it yeah it's yeah i mean for obvious reasons like yeah i can't drive but then that leads to a bunch of other things right like being able to help in certain situations like i had a friend move last week and not being able to say like hey you want me to drive the u-haul for you like things like that or just kind of it's not as simple as just not being able to drive and get places right as like helping out your friends things like that yeah um yeah i know that's the first thing that came to mind yeah and then so what about things that you can do that sighted people can't do um i found some good restaurants based on smelling the food <laughs> <laughs> you know, one thing comes to mind for me is that you can always tell who is coming up when we're running around central park before i can because you hear them and you know who it is before i even see who it is so you know in that respect i feel like your other senses might be heightened in comparison to, to to mine, for example. Yeah, and I think it, it's a mixture of heightened and also just needing to rely on them more and thus honing them, you know, more. Um, and it's interesting you say that because like, I, I wouldn't have thought to point that out, you know, so I'm sure there are things that I do that I don't even realize is abnormal or, or unusual or whatever it is, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's right. I completely agree. So a couple of other questions. So... You weren't born blind, but your sight got mm -hmm. progressively worse until you went completely blind. You know, that's a huge change. How did you manage to cope with that? And what were the emotions that you felt like going through that? Yeah, I it, I had stable vision, right? And then over the course of maybe three weeks, it went from stable, like as good as I remember it being, being able to ride bikes on my own independently, like sort of sketchily drive, whatever it is over three weeks went from that to basically blackness. And, uh, you know, it was really, really jarring, super life-changing. Like, uh, you know, I'd walk home every day within those three weeks and slowly those, the, the street signs would get more and more blurry. Um, so I could like see it deteriorating. Um, and I think the things that really kept things going was one friends, like I could either be stuck indoors and, and not adjust and adapt and all that, or, you know, I wanted to hang out with my friends, which means I had to learn how to text. I had to learn how to use adaptive technologies. Like I had to learn how to use a cane because if, if I didn't do that, I'd be stuck indoors all day. So like the, the need to adapt really drove me to learn all these things and was honestly a distraction while I was kind of getting used to the new normal. That's so interesting. So you, you basically, you know, took on the challenge, decided, okay, look, there's one of two things I could do. I could either just be really stubborn and refuse to accept the fact that I'm going blind and not adapt, or just put all my effort into adapting, realize that and accepting, you know, what was happening and adapt. And that was where you focus your efforts. Yeah. And I work, you know, with my role with Achilles, I work with a lot of people who are newly, whatever disability they have, right? Blindness or whatever it is. And I noticed that there's a big difference between people who accept who they are and where they are and people who don't. And the people who don't accept, 
they're never able to adapt or overcome as effectively because you know if you're fighting against who you are or what you are how can you embrace it and then use that as your advantage you know versus the moment you just accept okay now i'm blind you're able to then harness that and just move on and just grow you know and that, that's it's a really big difference yeah and i think that that could apply to any person in any type of life with or without a disability uh you know acceptance is like one of the first things you have to um accept uh and and once as soon as you do that uh then you can like you say focus your efforts onto um onto the next steps and and making sure that you you know you get through that that process yeah i mean i'll meet people who've been blind for 20 30 years and they still if you ask them like are you blind they, they don't identify as someone who is blind they're just continuously fighting against it you know they're they view it as something that needs to be cured which, you know, that's whatever, whole other thing, but it, it, you need to accept it, right? Like that's, that's how you grow from something. Yeah, no, that's, that's amazing. And um, so what, speaking of, you know, accepting things and what's the worst bit about being blind? The absolute worst bit of being blind. Um, that you've had to accept. <laughs> not seeing (laughs) (laughs) okay next question um (laughs) trust me can i just say there are some things in life you actually don't want to see so i feel like (laughs) in some instances it might be an advantage (laughs) yeah i will say like getting into this whole adaptive sports world i do i do want to guide myself like I, I do wonder what it would be like to guide other people in running or cycling and stuff like that. I, I don't know if that's the worst thing or not, but something that's that something that you about. feel like you might be missing out on. Yes. It would be cool to yes. guide someone. Okay. Yes. Okay. And then what's the best bit about being blind? What are the, what are the great things about being blind? I think you notice different things, you know, when you're kind of like what you talked talk about, like honing different senses. Like I don't have sight, therefore I'm forced to focus on, other things and therefore i notice things that other people don't notice whether it's parts of music or the way a certain street sounds or whatever you know just things that other people don't notice i tend to notice and i think that's really cool ah that's awesome and um just you know we live in a a a day and age where it's really important that we get our terminology correct Mm -hmm. and you know i've been saying blind you've been saying blind but there are of course other terms like visually impaired and, and so on can you just give us the down low on that? Does it matter? Does it not matter? If it does matter, what should we say? I think the two two universal terms, blind and low vision, low vision being everybody, if they're partially sighted or totally blind, whatever it is, and blind, general, I mean, if you're saying someone is totally blind, it means they have zero vision. Um, you'll come across different organizations that use blindness, at, or that they'll say blind, they'll, they'll mean low vision. They'll say low vision, they mean blind. Um, in the past in the U S people have used visually impaired and people outside the U S don't use visually impaired. So there's a whole spectrum. You can't really go wrong. If you just say low vision or blind, that tends to be the most universal. If you say low vision or blind, a low vision yeah, or blind yeah. equal pretty, pretty much. Um, low vision would include everybody. Okay. People who are partially sighted out, and blind would, you know, like if you're trying to get a point across and you like, you can only use one word, blind would work. <laughs> blind, okay. Got it. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's the, I think that's the take home message. Blind is fine. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. And then, you know, a question that I think a lot of people might want to know the answer to is if you see a blind person in, for example, New York city or anywhere, and they're walking around, they might be crossing a street or something. Should you, how, how should you react? Should you go up and offer help? Should you offer to cross the road? Should you ask them where they're going if they want it? Or, or should you, should you not? Should you let them, if they look independent, should you let them go on? Like, how should you act? I think asking if, do you need any help? I think that's a very good thing because you never know, maybe they do. Right. Why well, think I'd say one thing to not do is grab them and like, pull them across the street. Like if you see a blind person waiting at a curb cut, don't just, don't just grab them and pull them across the street, <laughs> assuming that that's what they want you to do. Cause you'd be surprised how many people do that. <laughs> and, they just, yeah, they just yeah. grab you like fit, like grab they your arm and like, say, you're yeah, coming with just me. Grab your arm and just, and just like pull you somewhere. And like, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> De- definitely ask. Um, even in, in, in some instances, even if you ask politely and don't grab them, 
you know, the whoever's blind or whoever's standing there might react kind of negatively. And to that, I'll say just because you're blind doesn't make you a nice person. So <laughs> don't just, you know, don't just don't just take that one experience if it is a negative one as painting the whole community with a broad brush, right? Like yeah. offer help just like you would anyone else. Okay. I love it. I love it. All right. So you mentioned earlier, uh, I mentioned that you used Instagram and you were mentioning that you use technology. Can you just give uh, the SparkNote version of like, how on earth do you use a cell phone? How do you use a computer? Like, how do you use all these things that people who are sighted use and they have screens? How do you use them? There is a software called screen reading software. And basically anywhere you touch on a screen or, you know, navigate on a computer, it'll read what that is. So if I touch my phone, it'll basically read anywhere I move my finger. So screen readers are built into most modern pieces of technology these days. And that's basically your like golden ticket to that, 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 that <clears throat> audio gives you the, the visual blueprint to whatever you're using. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, got it. Cause I, I've heard, and I have to say, so I've heard, I, I've heard you listening to it and the other blind guys who you and I both know and who I guide and so on. And honestly, it's inaudible or I can hear it, but I can't understand it because it's so quick because you guys do it at like the fastest pace of, of speaking. And it's incredible to me that that like, that's something that you can do that, that I, that's another thing that like a lot of blind people can do that, that uh, sighted people can't. Oh, well, I, I guess we could train ourselves to, but you could just do it so quickly. How long did it take you to be able to listen to stuff so quickly like that, that I don't even understand? I'd say it took months. Um, yeah. I like to describe it as like Siri on steroids, right? If, like, just, <laughs> ask, if people want an example of the voice. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you listen to it for a couple of weeks and you slowly bump up the speed. Um, it helps because that way we, we call sighted. Some, sometimes you call sighted people sighties. Uh, sighties don't really sighties. hear what you're, what, you know, I what, love you're, what that. you're texting. How, how have I known you for this many years and I've never heard sighties before? <laughs> I don't know. No. <laughs> But, um, but yeah, that, you know, if you want to stop, if I want to stop Tom from listening into my, my nefarious text messages, right. <laughs> the only option is to speed up that speed super fast. So the site just can't hear. I, I love it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. So, um, you know, there are tons of apps out there, you know, are some of them really easy to use and others just like very difficult? Yes. Um, yeah, you know, and, and what could they do to, to make it easier? Huge difference in apps and some apps you'd be surprised. Like some apps that are made by, you know, pretty well-known companies are not super accessible. And some apps that are tiny, like no name, whatever are very accessible. The big thing is labeling buttons. So like, for example, if you open an app, you know, bottom left corner, say it's like the home tab. Um, if that's, if that home tab is not labeled, then for me, all it'll say is button. So like I'll put my finger on it. It just says button, button, button. Doesn't actually say home. So like labeling what the different features are, that's probably, a, that's a big accessibility thing. Yeah. And we're going to get into accessibility and just what everyone and companies and countries could do better, I think, to um, to help uh, people with disabilities in uh, towards the end. But I've got a few more fun questions that I want to ask you uh, right now. So a few uh, quick fire questions. Would you rather be deaf or blind? And why? <laughs> <laughs> um i'd say blind i mean one because it's it's what i know um yeah blind but Why? like it's Music. what you know but like but what what else what else about it um listening to music just listening to the world around me i feel and it's a toss-up right because if i was deaf i might not be able, I, I can't listen to stuff but i could i could drive i could fly planes i can do something like that so yeah, nah, I'd say blind. It's it's the devil, you know, you know. <laughs> I also say that, like, you know, you've been to my Thanksgivings and stuff. And, yeah. you know, your experience is pretty close to everyone else's experience there. Yeah, we can see each other and so on. But, like, you're enjoying the conversation just like everyone else. You're enjoying the food. Like, you know, you're, you're very sociable. And would... Is is the is the blind is the deaf community as sociable as the blind community? Like, I, obviously, we don't want to draw huge generalizations, yeah. but but like, what what's your experience of that? I'd say yeah. I mean, I have some friends who are deaf, um, and they can you know if they're like visually looking at you, they can tell what you're saying just from mouth movements, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's just different, right? Like for that, when I was your thing, one of one of your your friends like helped me get some food off of the the the, the main serving plates. If yeah. I was deaf, but I could see, like I could do that myself. So, right. So 
there's always like there's a, yeah there's always things pros yeah. and cons <laughs> okay so speaking yeah, of yeah. that how do you eat when you're blind like how does that work um you can either well for me so i i map out a plate with just with my fork right so i kind of just tap around it just get a sense of where things are if if no one describes it to me yeah um and then just kind of go from there got um, it and, and like usually there's mystery, someone telling like... you what's on your plate or but i mean at home you might cook for yourself right yeah yeah well, if i cook for myself if i'm preparing it myself then obviously i know where i put things um if i order at a restaurant obviously like i know what i ordered so i can yeah. tell the difference between like a steak and broccoli right like it's yeah. pretty for the most part like it's pretty straightforward have you ever had an absolute shocker where you've like eaten something revolting? <laughs> uh, so, go on. yeah, I was in uh, in Tennessee with my friend Brian. We were racing cycling nationals and we went to Shoney's, which is like a Southern diner chain buffet. Okay. And he wanted to mess with me. So he got me this massive plate with like everything on the buffet and didn't tell me what anything was. <laughs> and just was like, eat it. <laughs> that, uh, I was how was it? Like, did he put anything thing. revolting on the plate? Oh, I mean, it was like, you know, like meatball next to a little bit of cheesecake next to like a piece oh my... of pineapple. Like it was, it was the most absurd thing, but it was so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that you enjoy that because I would have actually probably been quite annoyed if I was having dessert and main course on my same plate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're a very chilled guy, Francesco. All right. Yeah. Um, what about like things like, like when you fill, fill up your cup of, of water or whatever from the, from the fridge or pouring you know, pouring something, how do you know when it's like reach the near the top of the glass, you don't spill it? So how a blind, how they're, how we're taught is you put your finger like kind of over the edge and you kind of, you know, you, that way you can feel when something's almost full. Now, yeah. like I, I don't want to get my finger in everything I'm drinking. So for me, most of the time I just listen. Cause if you, if you fill a cup uh, and it's easier to hear in a bottle, but if you fill it, the sound changes as it gets more full. Um, wow. and so if you, if you get to you, you know, it, and it, again, it's easier to hear with a bottle because the bottle reverberates a little more, yeah. um, but you can hear the pitch of the water change. Oh, that's awesome. Okay. That's yeah. really, I did not know that. Okay. Yeah. Has anyone ever taken advantage of you being blind? You know, like you might have to pay for something overcharged you anything bad like that. Um, not that I can think. I know my friend, my friend Simon, who's also totally blind. Um, someone helped him get out of a, a train station, and as he was, as they were climbing the stairs, like the guy had his hand on my friend's backpack and actually took his wallet out of his really? bag, like while he was helping him. Are you serious? Um, that's awful. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that that comes to mind. Do you think they're intimidated by the fact that you're six foot six? <laughs> like I'm not gonna maybe mess. or how I'm flailing my cane around, you know. <laughs> well, I'm I'm really sad to hear that about Simon, but uh I'm glad nothing's happened to uh to you. Uh what about Braille? Let's talk about Braille. How does every blind person learn how to read Braille? Did you? Uh yeah. is there enough Braille out there? Is there sometimes where you wish there was Braille where it's not? Um if you were blind as a younger person, you learn Braille because Braille's part of a lot of like schools growing yeah. up. If you're blind or if you if you become blind later on in life, a lot of times you don't learn Braille. Um, I'd say it, uh, Braille music is a really big thing. Um, reading a lot of signs like elevator buttons and room labels and hotels, right? I travel a lot. So like how I find my hotel room is Braille door labels. Um, it's definitely usable. Not, I mean, not as much as it was 50 years ago, right? Because now there's technology, but it's definitely not a dead thing. And when did you learn it? Because you obviously weren't born blind. So when did you learn yeah. it? Yeah. So I so I read Braille. I'm not super smooth or fast because I learned later on in life. And I just kind of forced myself to learn it because like, it was like, I, I got to learn this, right? Like it, it comes in handy. So I, I learned like in college and out, out of college. Okay, got it. I think it's so cool. There's, you know, there's Braille competitions. I think it's every year, right? They, they, they um, you know, it's like, like a conference for blind people and they have competitions like who can read the fastest and stuff. And I was like, I I'd love to go and like spectate. Like, I think that would be an amazing event. Have you been? Oh, it's super cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I went with my friend Andrew, who's also totally blind. Um, we have like citywide, statewide, and then there's actually there's Braille National Championships, which is uh, it's, it's kind of funny Incredible. Uh, to think about. But yeah, broken up by grade, you know, kindergarten through twelfth grade, and yeah, it's it's cool. I absolutely love it. All right, so um, how do you pee when you're blind? You know, because I sometimes get up in the morning. <laughs> 
or in the middle of the night, I need to go to the restroom and I don't uh, want to switch the light on. And I'm like, oh, don't worry, yeah. I got this. I can just do this with the lights off. And it's a mess. And so <laughs> that's like you, but every day. So how do you, how do you do it? Yeah, not the mess part, the no lights part. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah, please. Sorry, yeah, no, that's, that's a clarification. I'm the one who makes the mess, Francesca. Super <laughs> yeah. clean. What? How do you how do you manage that? <laughs> give, me, give me some tips. Well, I will say so. Similar to filling a cup with water, right? Yeah. Like you can hear a toilet bowl because it has different acoustics. Okay. So if you're over it, you can you can sense or hear where it is. Oh. Um, and I'm actually the best roommate, as Tom knows, because uh, we've traveled together. Like I don't flip on the lights. Right? No, you, I know. I yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's really not. It's that is what that is one of the greatest things about being friends with a blind person is that <laughs> the lights are constantly off at night. They're not flicking them on to like, you know, brush their teeth or whatever when you're sleeping. Yeah. Pitch black. You can do everything. It's amazing. Or they're just on because we don't realize they're on. <laughs> <laughs> that's true i remember that did happen on uh, on one trip but not in my room yeah. it was in your room yeah, yeah all right uh what about cooking um you were talking about eating like how do you cook you know i mean that's that's fire and like you're dealing with fire and you can't see like that is insane to me how do you do that so yeah one of my roommates who's totally blind andrew he's he's afraid of fire so i, I hold his hand near the stove just to like mess with him sometimes <laughs> which is a great which is a great blind friend thing to do great friends um <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, uh, I guess the, the big thing comes to mind is like centering, right? So if I have a pot or a pan on a stove, like knowing how to center it and I, you kind of just use landmarks, like, all right, if you know the stove is a certain amount wide, you can just kind of gauge the width of the burner by the width of the stove and kind of figure out proportions like that. Yeah. Um, so it's just coming up with those little adaptations, but obviously cooking is cooking. So yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's, you cook it's a lot or do you cook less? Do you think you cook less because it's just like, oh, I'm just going to order. It's too, it's easy to order. Like, or do you cook um, like a decent amount? I cook a lot just because, you know, to stay on top of nutrition for training and racing yeah. and stuff like that. It's just easier um, and cheaper. <laughs> so, and I, I like, I mean, I, you know, a lot of veggies, Tom. I, I've been, I've been digging into the veggies lately. So I'm glad to hear that. Um, yeah. Cause, yeah. Cause you only ever ate chocolate whenever I saw you. No, that's a lie. He's a, he's a <laughs> All right. Um, so what about stuff like when you go into a hotel? Like how do you know where's, where's the soap, shampoo, conditioner? Like, how do you know all that stuff? When, like, so I, it's I actually kind of it. fun. Okay. Yeah, when I go into a new, like, hotel room, it's like a mystery, right? Now, like, I've been in enough hotel rooms, you kind of know where things are laid out. But, like, where is the bed in relation to, like, the, the couch or the TV thing or stuff? Yeah. So it, it's a lot of exploration mapping out. I just kind of I walk around with my cane and just tap against different things and you know, as long as you grid things out, it, it's easy to categorize and map. So right. yeah, and then um, in terms of shampoo, um, there's an app on the phone. There, there's a few apps, but there's there's like off uh, it's called OCR, um, and it just kind of scans different things using your phone's camera and it'll read it. Oh wow! It, yeah, it'll yeah, it'll yeah. what it? You said it'll Greek it? It'll read, read, read it, read it. Got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's that's so, amazing. I did not know that that app even existed. The the wonders of model, modern technology, incredible. And like we're in a very, I, I wouldn't you agree, like pretty good era if you are blind because there are those those types of technologies that can help you. Totally, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, alternatively, you're just like squeezing it a little out on your hand, like this is you know this is like body wash or like shampoo, like <laughs> does yeah. it smell like? Sh <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. All right, so Francesco, look, we're all human beings. You know, most of us oh. during our lives. We'll have sex. You're blind. Um, I don't want to assume anything, but if you have had sex, what's it like to have sex as a blind person? Um, that's a great question. I'd say, I mean, it's the same as if you weren't blind, like sex is sex, right? It's, it, it's definitely different. It's interesting because, again, most people have never had sex with a blind person. So I, I, like one thing I hear is like not having to worry about visual responses or cues or anything like that right so like that's something i uh, i'm thinking of yeah um i don't know turn the lights off next time and then and, and see what happens <laughs> see what <it's> like. <laughs> then you get your answer everyone turn the yeah, lights except off. you know you got to start the whole blindfolds night. blindfolds yeah yeah just walk into the bar blindfolded and just see what happens <laughs> <laughs> i love it i love it and is is dating any different being blind than being sighted um I mean, there's, there's always, obviously, there's the initial judgment, right? Like with anything that's a little different, whether you're blind or you're super short or whatever it is, um, 
there's always that barrier that you're overcoming. Um, but just like anything else, if you use it as something, you know, as an advantage, you use it as a pro, as something that's, that makes you stand apart, then I don't view it as a negative thing. And it's, it's been fine. Yeah. Amazing. It's great to hear Francesco. Okay. A couple of questions about Achilles international. Then I got a few fun ones to end with, and then we'll wrap it up. So you're director of Achilles international, New York city. Can you just tell a little bit, uh, us a little bit uh, about what Achilles international is and what you do for them? Yeah, so Achilles International, global organization, um, we do endurance sports uh, for people with all different disabilities. So people who are blind, low vision like myself, amputees, brain injuries, spinal cord injuries, intellectual disabilities, like literally any type of categorized disability. Um, we have as Achilles athletes, and then we train guides and volunteer runners like yourself, Tom, uh, to run or swim or bike with these athletes. So that's really, really cool. What I do is I lead all the New York City area operations for Achilles. So in the five boroughs, we're expanding to Staten Island actually this year, which is super oh, nice. Cool. Um, and just leading all the workouts locations uh, within New York City. That's what I do. That's amazing. And if anyone wants to get involved in Achilles, whether it's to be a guide, work with athletes with disabilities, and there's athletes of all different types of disabilities, like blindness, people with um, prostheses, you know, traumatic brain injury, all that kind of stuff. So, and you don't, I, I also want to mention, you don't have to be a super fast runner or anything to, to be a guide, you know, some people want to walk and so on. Um, how do people get involved in Achilles? Um, best way is go to the website, achillesinternational.org. And on there, all the different chapters are listed, the volunteer, you know, join application, all that stuff is listed. So achillesinternational.org, uh, best place to start. Super. Thank you so much. All right. Couple of fun questions. Okay. What's your favorite book and what's your favorite movie and why? I love The Count of Monte Cristo. Yes. Um, super fun. Wait, um, book or movie? Favorite... No, 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 book. Book, book okay. Book, book, book. Yeah, okay. it wasn't as bad as a movie. Okay. Um, I don't know, movie. School of Rock. I'd say School of Rock. Such School a good Rock. movie. Awesome. Okay. Final question, Francesco. If you could give one piece of advice to someone who's struggling in life, what would it be? I'd say reframe the situation, right? You obviously, like, it could be a physical struggle. It could be emotional. It could be all different things. It's reframe what's possible. Identify, right, like, what it is, what you're trying to do and overcome whatever that obstacle is and you you need forward momentum if you're not moving forward you're moving backwards awesome francesco magisano it has been an absolute pleasure thank you very much for being on the show thanks tom super cool